Great. Thank you guys for uh, inviting me to talk to you guys today. Um, my name is Todd Chang. I am a clinical physician, although I spend more of my time with virtual patients these days. Um, so I'm in pediatric emergency medicine, which means I watch a lot of cartoons and I have no attention span, so I'm basically a toddler. <laughs> Um, and today, I'm going to focus this talk more on VR and virtual reality, although many of the principles apply to serious games and AR as well. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I have a couple of disclosures. Um, I am a subject matter expert for a couple of video game companies, which is a lot of fun. And we had a lot of uh, grant support from Oculus from Facebook. How many of you work in a center where you already have a VR or serious games component that is as good as your mannequin-based components. Awesome. How many of you have a few VR headsets, maybe a, like the digital lab, a computer dedicated to serious gaming in your center? Perfect. How many of you want to get to that place where you want to implement? Awesome. So these are the objectives of this talk. We can start really, really basic from the, the tiny bits of hardware for those of us who are beginners. And well, we'll go all the way up to the um, we'll go all the way up to the more advanced things for those of you who already know what you're doing. So these are the lenses that we're going to look at VR, um, the practical, academic, and integrative. I started in academia, so if it were any warmer, I would be wearing a sweater vest right now. But we're going to get more in the down and dirty, the real nuts and bolts as well. Okay, so let's start practical. And what is VR in this case? Uh, the definition of VR has changed time and there are groups that are trying to uh, get a handle on the definition. This game, Heart Code, uh, that you may have actually used in BLS and PALS and ACLS, is no longer the true definition of virtual reality. There's virtual patients, um, but virtual reality in this case, in the focus of this talk, is about uh, 3D head-mounted virtual reality, which looks something like this. So um, this is one of our research assistants who's now in medical school. Congratulations to Audra. Um, who's basically using the Oculus Rift so that you're physically walking in a virtual environment. She really can't see anything else besides what's in there right now. Um, some of them have controllers so that you can see your hands and execute different actions. Okay. Um, how many of you have tried virtual reality and almost threw up? Right? It sucks, right? So there's a reason that uh, some of these problems exist. And we're going to introduce a term called degree of freedom. Three degrees of freedom versus six degrees of freedom, DOF for short. The first three degrees of freedom are also available on your phone when you take the panorama shots, right? You can tell who's a tourist by the people who are going like this the whole time, right? So these are the rotational movements of three degrees of freedom. But if you only have three degrees of freedom, it will not know where you are in absolute space. You can't walk forward. You can't stand up. Otherwise, the images will not change, and therefore you get really, really dizzy. Um, some phone devices, in other words, using your phone for VR for three degree of freedom, include the uh, Google Dreamweaver, the Google Cardboard, and the VR, uh, Gear VR from Samsung. But you can also upgrade to the standalones. In other words, the processing speed is actually within the hardware itself, so the Oculus Go, the Lenovo um, Mirage, and the Vive Focus. These come with controllers, so you have a little bit more interactivity. The problem, of course, is that if you stand up or do any actual movement around, you're going to get really dizzy because the pictures do not move with you. So you have to stand or sit really still when you use these. However, if you add to the other three degrees of freedom, and these are gamer terms, of course, of elevating, surging, and strafing, then you can actually start moving around. And the amount of vertigo that you have in a six degree of freedom virtual reality set is actually quite low, thankfully. This means that you're allowed to tell exactly where you are in space, within a room, within an environment, or in some cases, just out in the wilderness. So what this means is that it needs extra sensors, not just on your position and your rotation, the first three degrees of freedom, but the other three are captured by other sensors. Sometimes the sensors are on the outside, as in these products. So this is the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive Pro, the PlayStation VR, and the Valve Index. There's a couple more that have probably been invented as of this week. Um, and these sensors are placed outside of the room, I'm sorry, outside of you, somewhere in the room, so that it knows exactly where you are at any given moment. That was my graceful twirl. 
Um, and these um, are actually wired. They've been removed for marketing purposes, so it doesn't look quite as clunky. But the wire actually connects to a gaming computer, which is probably your more expensive component. And all the processing speed is done by the computer, and therefore it's the most powerful version of virtual reality that you can get. Um, on the other hand, this is the Oculus Rift S. In this uh, version, which is available now, the sensors are on the, in, the actual headset itself, called inside-out tracking. In other words, you don't need external sensors, and it continually monitors where you are in space by looking around and seeing the differences in the way that the room moves, contrary to your goggles. And then if you want to go wireless, there are other solutions. There's plugins for the Nova Mirage and the uh, Vive Focus, and then a standalone product called the Oculus Quest that allow you full six degrees of freedom motion, uh, no wires because all the computing speed is inside your headset, and you can have scenarios that look like this. So in this scenario, you're trying to shoot each other, but in your scenarios, please don't do that, um, you might be working on the same patient together. You might be running around in a disaster or a war zone, right? So you can program a whole different set of scenarios using the advantages of VR. So when you're thinking about the hardware solutions of what to purchase, what to get, these are the types of hardware VR that you might have in your repertoire for adding virtual reality to your sim lab. Questions so far? All right. Before we get any further, let me just address the slight differences in the uh, abbreviations. Sorry. I have a hard time. Hello? <laughs> With a kid? No, sorry. It's, I have a hard time speaking when there's a camera right in front of my face. Um, so, uh, VR, AR, and XR. Sometimes you'll see the abbreviation MR for mixed reality, which I prefer the XR version. For those of you in healthcare, you'll know why. Um, but VR means that you're excluding all audiovisual. Um, is stimuli. In other words, you're completely within the virtual world. You can put in sound canceling headphones and you are in a completely different place. AR, on the other hand, and you've seen some of the products in the exhibit hall, you allow you to pass through so you can see the entirety of reality. But projected onto the screen are these holographs or holograms that may just be floating there or perhaps interacting with the real world. Um, for those of you who play games, what is this? <laughs> well, yeah, Pokemon Go. Do you know that in worldwide, Pikachu is more widely known than Mickey Mouse? Anyway, so um, this is augmented reality. It allows you to see what's going on behind Pikachu, but Pikachu does not care what it's in front of. It could be grass, it could be in your room, it could be in the toilet if you're in the bathroom. It doesn't really matter. But when you use mixed reality, and this is the true definition of mixed reality, your hologram is actually interacting with the real world. So in this um, contrived example of ridiculously good-looking, diverse people, um, <laughs> you have a hologram. It's always the stock photo. Um, the, you have a hologram that's actually interacting with a table surface so that when, wherever you're looking at from a different point of view, it's, it looks like it's just sitting on the table. So this is an example of mixed reality. And as the technology improves, this is what you're going to have in your simulation center eventually. One other thing, and this is actually pretty important. Many of us came from the healthcare world, perhaps maybe business operations, maybe um, engineering. But people who work in the digital spheres, serious games, VR and AR, often come from entertainment and cinematics. Right? And it's not just because I work in Los Angeles, but this is actually the framework with many uh, developers. So what works in an entertainment game may be woefully horrifying in a learning game. And you have to watch out for these contrasts. Okay, is VR the right choice? Um, like we said, there's appropriate and maybe inappropriate. And two of them are future focused, two of them are private focused. And most of us are going to be this way. But you should be aware of what's going on. You take them out of reality, you put them in a very calculated, precise reality, you enable VR to visualize something that you can't easily do or reality, or you go full on simulation, just like you would with mannequins and SPs, but in the VR world. So, every escape is kind of obvious. You can use it for rotation, you can use it to relax, go find someone else. Uh, we use it for distraction therapy for painful procedures with the paper form. There are data sensitization, actually, has a fair amount of light sensitization in psychology. So, um, phobia treatments and PTSD treatments have been shown in virtual reality to have improved symptoms after PTSD taken in the military to turn this into a 
And this is an example from MindRace, this is Studio 500, that does VR simulations for phobias. And this particular example is germophobia, where you start in the most pristine, cleanest bathroom ever, and then you gradually see a little stain here, a little slime there, like, oh my gosh, what is that in the corner? Gradually, until you get to the point where you feel like you have a cold against you. Exposure to therapy, therapeutic sensitivity. On the provider side, three-dimensional visualization has a many forms. This is 360 cameras with a picture-in-picture, and it's used often in different operating theaters. So you don't need to just look at what's going on here. You need to know exactly what's going on in the entirety of the situation. The 360 cameras, VR, enable a much wider view for teamwork or situational awareness that has more than wider than the biggest white screen the screen. When you do these 60 visualization pieces of cameras, you may only need a few degree of capacity for the actual device. You just need to sit there and look around as the action is completely on the floor. On the other hand, you go for the rendering account. So this is a project from Stanford and Dr. David Maxwell in the Colorado Department, where we created virtual um, congenital cardiac Congenital children's hearts with different chambers that are missing, but pre operative stuff, for both educational training and for family purposes, so the families can learn exactly what's happening with their children's hearts. Right. This way, you can actually interact, zoom it out, break it apart, pretend you're a red blood cell, walk around through the different chambers, and see what the surgery does in which you can put those off. In this movie, you do need an active components, you need something with a controller, but perhaps you can still do a single gap, so three degrees of three degrees. And then finally, if you're going to bring what we usually do with magnetic simulation into the virtual sphere, then you need as much freedom of movement as possible. So this is simulation training and assessment, and you pretty much need a six degree of freedom active simulation, so that you can move around as much as you can. So those are the four test cases that's been used already for virtual reality. And there's actually specific examples and advantages and disadvantages that we all have. So this is something that we wrote particularly in our discipline, and it applies to all of our clinical disciplines outside of the world. So we'll go over some of the advantages one at a time. The first is replicability. How many of you have to do the same scenario over and over and over and over and over and over? Right? You get really good at it. But sometimes there's variations depending on if you get that one student who's really got thorn on your side, or you have technical issues on one of the simulations. And when you have really high stakes simulations, it's just not acceptable for you. Okay? VR and software based simulations allow for perfect replicability as long as you technical things are right? Over, 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 over again, and click on the button. How many of you brought things through the airport today? I haven't even had runners with a TSA with your um, weird body parts. Right? I'd love to write a book of all the different books that I've said. But anyway, with magic based simulation, you can go from place to place. The portability is a big issue. The hardware for VR is really simple. You're doing a serious game on your iPad, and you do really great work on your iPad. Imagine all of your work in the on the bag. It's the same as not being so. My favorite advantage is asymmetry. This is the idea that you do not have to be in a room geographically more time same time as uh, the scenario is running. So they can actually do it themselves and use a quick faster model to run the scenarios without you. And it, it collects itself while you're sitting in my eyes and that's how you do it. Finally, how many of you do simulations in a campus that has more than one geographical location? That is a huge problem as the expectations for clinical care are supposed to be standardized across multiple hospitals that can't all get to you. How do you get the simulations out consistently throughout the different places? This is distribution. The idea that a software simulation can be supported everywhere on the portal button, and you don't have to be there. Some of the biggest proponents of VR digital simulations, those in our rural and older CMS agencies, um, particularly in Alaska, where the program works, it's really difficult to get to a really high state. High states and uh, state of the art situations. And then something unique to VR, uh, the advantage of inclusive innovation, that is the ability to just 
wipe out all other stimuli, the other, at least for hearing sounds, and for looking at things visually, you can completely take them out of the reality. Sometimes for a lot of people, they may be stuck by something that doesn't seem real, the screen doesn't seem right, that's not how we uh, put the materials in the cabinet. So inclusive immersion allows you to control all of that. So then, what's the problem? It sounds amazing, but there's some disadvantages, right? Uh, for those of you who went into the VR world, there's a lot of high front end costs. The cost model and the value proposition for VR and digital simulations is actually quite different from that of the basic equation. And I'll give you an example over here. If you go the asynchronous route, you know, which many people do their own simulations at home or in a different uh, lab, you have to accommodate um, using fixed algorithms. In other words, you've had people shout out or ask for some of the weirdest medications or do something that's completely unexpected. And sometimes it might be a decent thing to do. You have to create these things all ahead of time and allow the algorithm to take care of it because you are not there. So sometimes VR will seem very linear and not very accommodated to a wide variety of conditions. So one solution would be to synchronize the you're right there and have the software allow you to change things as the difficulty changes. Then you run into better Many of our Wi-Fi networks, including the centers, is not sufficient to allow the VR to be streamed over months. And in order to synchronously change something with VR, you need a high level of bandwidth, like 5G or higher, in order to accomplish this, not in the case of us. Finally, you're going to invite specialty people, people with knowledge about physical rules. Right? So your sim center may not have the funding or have the resources to get contacts in order. You can see that our placement of the line is right here. In the third view, she actually is kind of cut off from her PowerPoint, but she actually sees the monitor on like, her first try as soon as she wants it, whereas these folks and all the folks are not. We would never have seen this with a third party camera. So these are the unusual uh, inferences and things that you can learn from first person view. What is it like to have to step out of a step stool to view or have to step on a step stool? I mean, you have to step to step stool to actually see anything, right? And imagine trying to explain that to a tall person who's not this. So these are some of the things that also help with the placement. Now, we're realizing that this is where the monitor actually is in our association. And this is the data that we can create to uh, push the room people to change the world. Okay, let's put everything together in the final moments. Things to decide for your center. Think about the hardware. Think about where you're going to do it with your geography. Partnership with the actual software, where you might go to commercial or to something. Or you can home grow it if you have the resources and funding. Think about reuse policies, which sounds silly, but it's actually important. And how do you integrate it into the hardware? These are your choices for the hardware models. Right? To actually get all of them. They're not too expensive. Right. You have to um, do your VRs, for example, Google Cardboard is like $50. Um, the store is about $200. Um, and uh, there's a class of too many in the US to It's not the worst. If you have a whole bunch of passive ones, then they just need to be around at the conference table and look delightful like the software is doing. Alternatively, if you're going to do six degrees of freedom, whether you want it or not, they recommend. 10 foot by 10 foot square, that's safe without any intrusions. If you have a wire, it's recommended to go above with the closest thing that you can. And a no reflective, um, no mirrors, no low mirrors that you may have in a simulation center, because they interfere with the sensor's ability to track the wire. I literally did this like three days ago, too. <laughs> Six years ago. So the question was, no mirrors, even the one-way mirrors that we don't have to control mirrors. The general goal, if you can avoid it, is to not have it. Or just place a drape over it, that's fine. Don't forget that because VR transcends your sync center, you can actually ask for help, perhaps um, get funding from external sources, like your clinical psychology, which we call teams, 
if you have child life, if you're in a pediatric center, you have child life, they are huge proponents of VR. They may be able to purchase the hardware for you for sure. Uh, don't forget that you need a lot of hardware the IS services. They do want to be on board. They do need to understand that your bandwidth needs are going to be much different than the rest of the hospital, and it will not have protected health information. Um, if you are in a university setting, if you have school of engineering, school of cinematics, uh, whatever that school is called, you have a problem. There's a lot of really, really bright people to work on these situations. And then VR is really sexy. So patient experience and marketing within hospital institutions <coughs> will almost always want to get in. I say, great, sure, come on in. Would you like to do the hardware? Sure. Don't forget about some way to get all the stuff off of it. And then a couple of questions that you get to ask yourself. Do you want to build it yourself, or do you want to use a commercial software product? And that's up to you. Uh, you can go both ways, you can go with a scenario, you can go with a scenario. But the amount of funding that you need will be greater than building it yourself. There may even be opportunities to craft it and how you want. Second question, if you want to just look at different disciplines look at but a surgery in VR has a very different medical VR than a nursing VR and another VR. A team of VR has a completely different surgery. Right, so the, the focus of the VR is a predictive engineering. And then you've always had those people who walk in, the first thing in debriefing is that kind of not real. And then you have to be professional, stop for that eye roll, and be like, that's a very good answer, but let's explore that. You're going to get a lot more. Uh, a lot of the facts you will struggle with a lot of the things that we do. Um, when we were doing this, our uh, trials with the RC, I actually asked our RC to, to get a collection on the computer so that before we get it, after we get consent, we would ask them to type their information on the keyboard. And my instructions were if the RC sees that they type like this, then they get extra 30 minutes, or extra 30 seconds, rather, on the tutorial than the other folks. And it's actually true. We actually show that the people who are older, wiser, and perhaps less tech less inclined keep typing like this, they actually take about you know, 33 seconds longer than the one who plays. Okay. You do have to take care of the meal effects. There's going to be a lot of it. And as soon as they get turned off by one VR experience, when it's vertigo, or you can't get the controls right, you're, you're pretty much going to lose them. So make sure you have some, um, some effort to take over. And then finally, I want to leave you with a video that uh, Pankyo has created for us. Um, you guys have done uh, uh, simulation for really long time. We really hear about the patients and the staff that we train. But for us, the Children's Hospital LA is not a good fit. If you're looking at all the 911 emergency calls in the United States, about 1% of all of those are serious critical pediatrics, which is relatively rare. It's technically a good thing, right? We don't want children to be sick with emergencies, but that rarity presents itself a training problem. Because pediatric emergencies are low frequency, high stakes events, training methodology to gain experiential learning, we have to basically create these experiences without causing harm to the patients. The most common way that we replicate that experience is through mannequin-based simulation. And that's how you train for different procedures, including resuscitations and how to assemble as a team. But mannequin-based simulation is costly both in time and effort. So that's when we build the simulation in virtual reality. started developing rash and difficulty breathing at a Chinese restaurant. My belly hurts! Doctor, I don't know what to do. Doctor, please help my heart. Doctor, what do you want to do?
took 18 seconds for you to intimate. That's like amazing. <laughs> but you make mistakes, you learn the consequences, you get feedback, and you try again to correct those mistakes. That's how people learn. In low frequency, high stakes events, there is no room for mistakes. The virtual reality setting provides a safe educational arena for you to practice and practice over and over again until you get better and better. Those mistakes can be made there, you learn from it, and then when the real thing happens, you'll be ready. You're learning where your knowledge caps are and that allows you to improve if you ever do encounter those situations again, and that should translate into you being a better doctor. There's so many different ways to help children and children's health, and we owe it to the kids to perform at our best.